Hello and welcome to Global Sanctuary for Elephants podcast, Global Rumblings. Global Sanctuary for Elephants, or GSC for short, is a non-profit organization with a mission to create vast safe spaces for captive elephants where they are able to heal physically and emotionally, often from very traumatic pasts. I'm your host, Nadia Mari, and I'll be taking you to the lush jungle of the Mato Grosso region in central Brazil, home of GSE's initial project, Elephant Sanctuary Brazil. Currently home to six female Asian elephants, lovingly referred to as the girls. Hi, welcome and thank you for tuning into this week's episode of Global Rumblings. Let's head on straight down to Brazil. Hello, Kat. Hello, Scott. Hi, Nadia. Hey, Nadia. How are you? I'm fine. It's still summer here in Germany and Europe, so yeah. I, I won't bore you with the details of the beautiful weather here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is turning windy here, so hopefully that doesn't get too windy in the microphone, but we will give it a shot since our office house is essentially outside. You still haven't got windows? It'll never have windows, hopefully. Ah, or doors. <laughs> well, I know you don't have windows. I know you don't have windows like in Europe with glass, um, but um, you have a door now, though. I think we said when you first moved in there, you didn't have a door either. We if have, you're looking around, just I was just going to gonna say, I like the fact that we both had to look. Do we have doors? We have most of the doors. The, the, the west facing side of the house is pretty much open because that's what looks towards all of the habitats and the barns and the entrance for security and monitoring. And right now, two of the doors are done. There's three panels to the door. Uh, two of the panels are done. The other one is waiting to be painted. So we're almost there. Ah. Oh, so if you look out to the west, so you could actually then uh, look at the beautiful sun uh, sunset every evening. Then, yep, yes, oh. that's the plan, and it strategically is strategically planned. Yeah, very much so. Actually, I don't think stunning is one of our. We, we've been a bit lax on our drinking slash uh, <laughs> podcast bingo game, which we did have three words, but we'll have to get into that uh, at a, and a, and another recording. I think we should add stunning uh, to mm-hmm. to our words as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, so last week we ended on a. Well, on a sad note, with, with Gita's passing, as Kat said, you know, we want them all to live forever. But the reality is they are geriatric. They are old when they come to you. They do bring a, yes, a huge variety of, of diseases. Well, not diseases, not the right word, but uh, maybe, I don't know, issues yeah, with ailments. them is maybe the right mm-hmm. word. Ailments and issues with them, which um, then manifest themselves. So maybe, yes, I'll just let you talk how Gita's passing then changed Maya's development, and also you had another third elephant there, then Hannah, and maybe talk more about her, introduce her to us. <laughs> you can't Hannah, look at Hannah's me perfect. because <laughs> you <laughs> love her. <laughs> you know how parents aren't supposed to have a favorite child. It took Scott how many years of me knowing you time. before you would start admitting that indeed you did it's probably a have a favorite. It's actually when I realized when I'm talking about them that you felt that internal change. Sure. You know, it's not like there's, you know, there's an even recognized necessarily that you have a preference of one for the other because they're also incredible and unique and have their special traits. But every now and then it was actually in Tennessee uh, when I was doing a presentation and I started talking about Sissy and Winky and it just changed the way my heart fluttered. Because <laughs> he <laughs> and, uh, wouldn't admit Sissy was his favorite back then either, which he they can were now both pretty admit. Equal. They were both pretty, those two were pretty. You're pretty a liar. Much the same. <laughs> you are a liar. <laughs> it doesn't mean you love Winky any less just because Sissy no, makes she's, you like uh, almost Winky blush when you talk I about her. I felt closer to Winky because of everything that we went through and to try to help her through all the struggles and, sure. you know, that long road for helping her see life differently. And, but I have a soft spot for Sissy and I have a soft spot for Hannah. Matter of fact, you call Hannah Sissy <laughs> on a somewhat regular basis. So, <laughs> All right. So let's go on with Hannah. Uh, uh, so Hannah, let's go back to a little bit. First heard about Hannah through rumor that there was an elephant. Actually, we heard about a few years before, I think. And again, we didn't have permits. Um, and Hannah came before... Ramba, yeah, Hannah came before Ramba. Um, and 
we had talked to the previous owner or there was room with the previous owner and they did not want to move her. She was a solitary elephant that was living on a hotel slash zoo slash. It was like they had a little mini amusement amusement park park at the hotel and that's where they kept her. Yeah, but she was not even part. Yeah, she was on the east coast of Brazil, way on the east coast. Um, and nice area. I'm sorry. Nice area. It was, yeah, it was a very pretty area. Um, there's actually a farm, the 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 hotel slash zoo slash farm slash aquarium uh, slash sugarcane farm <laughs> slash cachaceria. Uh, it was all all kinds of things combined. Um, they it was actually a beautiful area, and Hana had a little spot in the middle of the field completely isolated from everything around her. Uh, there was literally nothing around, um, no other animals, no other anything. Didn't they take uh, like a little train twice a day? Yeah, there was a train that would go visit her and the keepers would go out there and take care of her and uh, a couple of times a day. And the new owners are the ones that actually contacted us because they saw the, they didn't want the animals there. Uh, they wanted to move the animals out and they wanted to focus on the amusement park. I'm sorry, the the water park. Mm-hmm. element of it and so they contacted us and within a very short period of time we i think i was even in the united states when they called and we changed our flight after a conference i think it was actually just after the conference that you went to nadia just after you were here yeah october 2018 yeah yeah so after that conference i went directly there to sign the contract and i think it was about four weeks later or it was a short period later is when hana came so it was all very very fast yeah so how does a hotel slash zoo slash aquarium slash whatever have get an elephant? Anybody can have an elephant here, I think. I mean, it's so bizarre. We've said it before. I mean, look at my Angita. They're just chained up on a farm in the middle of nowhere. We heard so many rumors about elephants being on different properties in different states. And nobody has any really solid information. So when we initially heard about Hana, we weren't sure she even existed. It's, I don't know. It's very strange. To me, but apparently not to people who live here. So, <laughs> did she come from the circus? Had she been? Yeah, she was circus of... initially. Um, ah, she was circus yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah, circus, and then when she was removed from the circus, she went to uh, this small zoo. Um, it was probably very similar to Bambi. You know, once the circus legislation or the anti-traveling leg- uh, legislation started uh, being enacted, a lot of these elephants were quickly removed from the road and sent to the nearest place that could receive them. Um, and she was interesting when we first saw there, it was very interesting how, one, how isolated she was, as we said, but the fence, I mean, it was <laughs> in air quotes fence. <laughs> yeah. It was like a, a little skinny post that were like a meter and a half tall. Maybe they weren't very tall, meter and a half tall Four feet. Um, mm. with two cables that were connected to an electric fence. And mm. these were. I mean, the posts were all pushed out of alignment because she played with every single one of them. Um, <laughs> she would often escape, they said. Mm-hmm. And, and where would she go? And she would, to, to, when she would escape, she was actually surrounded on, on a couple of sides. There was a nice little pond down to the right uh, in front of her. And, and uh, then there was a sugarcane field to the left. And they said she never ambushed a sugarcane field. Uh, oh, really? She would actually probably because she was fed so much sugar cane anyway. Yeah. <laughs> she probably didn't need it anymore. <laughs> it was a principal part of her diet, which is not really good, but she had a lot of sugar cane. And then uh, she would actually go past the uh, cachaceria, and that's a cachaceria is where they make cachaça. It's a sugar cane alcohol. Um, and the, she would go behind the cachaceria, which was often not functioning because it was only functioning for a very short period of the year when they were harvesting the sugar cane. And she'd hang out behind the Kishasidia and just hang out there. Oh. And they said she went there all the time. Every time that she was out, she would go right there. Because it was shady just you. Ask her to no, come back. It wasn't that shady. It was just a different type of grass, maybe. And she just, you know, mm. it was more more manicured grass. And uh, I don't know if she liked that smaller, fresh grass, but she would go there. And when it was time to go back, oh, they would say, come yes. on back. And she would follow them right back. But at the same time, they were terrified of her. Ter- terrified of her. No one really went close to her. Sure, but when it came to stuff like that, she wouldn't allow it. Yeah. I mean, she also threw things. I mean, I think this. I think we have like every elephant that <laughs> is scheduled to come here and has come here all throw things, which. But they're taught to because people don't understand <laughs> no, the behavior. I understand. So, you know, but- because the elephants are being completely ignored many times and essentially neglected, they would. Um, 
And I just got self-conscious because I'm talking way more than Kat in this one, but Kat told me to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was also listening to both of you. But Kat, Kat also didn't go to see her there. Uh, nope. as someone else and you know, didn't I only get a met chance her to when visit. she got here. So, um, so I'm authorized <laughs> 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 to talk on this behalf. Now. All of you, baby. Um, so uh, she was, you know, like most elephants are ignored, they're neglected, they're not really seen. And yeah. they would throw things to get attention and they'd mm. immediately go and grab sugar cane and feed her. So you're teaching them to ah, throw rocks. And, um, and she also had the big thing we saw with her aside from a small yard that was filled with poop um, and mm. deep holes from when the, the rain season. Mountains of poop. Like when he says it's filled with poop, it's not like there were piles of poop here and there. There's they were a like them, a lot of pieces, five foot high piles of poop. I yeah. mean, <laughs> they it's were really so a lot of dung. Really, really bizarre. Her barn was a concrete block uh, barn, and it was initially had two different sections. And the back section was it didn't even have a roof anymore. And the back section, the walls were all caved in. The walls were all collapsed, so she oh. wasn't allowed the back section back section anymore. And she would go. It was really interesting because we went to go see her at night, and she would actually go into her barn at night, which had completely open on the front side. Uh, open on open doors and, or, or kind of windows and doors on the left side and no roof. So it wasn't much of a shelter anywhere, uh, yeah. but she would still go in there and, and sleep at night. Uh, a little hab habitually. Really interesting. Was the weather good enough then for her on the west, yeah, uh, west nice side there. of Brazil? It was, it's okay for her to be out all day then? Yeah. Uh, my and Gita, no. where they were, it would get really, really cold. Um, and it would okay. be, you know, two, three, five degrees and rainy for multiple days. And they had absolutely no shelter. Mm -hmm. um, where and no, no shelter from the sun when it was hot. I mean, they were just stuck in the middle of this field all the time. Yeah, yeah uh, they were um, where she was in, in Brazil. It's almost directly to the east of us, I'm a little bit north, and direct to the east. And it's you know the climate is is very similar to what it is here. Um, very rarely does it get chilly there. So Hannah was elephant number three. Then Hannah was elephant number three, and. Um, Another one of those, when we got ready for transport, we arrived with a transport container. Um, we had to open up her fence. Uh, let me go back to her when I came back, back to taking care of her. Sorry, when we were there, noticed that her vulva was incredibly inflamed. Um, and there were a lot of flies around it. And I asked him about what's going on. He said, yeah, she has this thing. Sometimes she gets flies. We put spray on it. But many times she doesn't let us do anything. Uh, so she was, and every time I walked at a different angle, you know, and I'm watching her closely. We watch all elephants closely. I'm not in the space with her at all, uh, but she can reach her nose over the fence, of course, the quasi fence. Um, and we don't let them get close enough, you know, to do anything and, and always respecting their space and respecting, as we talked about the Mayan Gita, of not encroaching on their life because, you know, they don't know us, you know, and we're starting to understand who they are and, and watching their behavior a little bit of distance. But I wanted to analyze a little bit about the physical uh, elements that she was, was were noticeable with her. Um, and they were very rarely able to do anything for this inflamed vulva, which then ended up having maggots and lesions and oh. it was really bad. Uh, and they couldn't do anything for her for the most part. So she was always flapping her tail, always miserable and didn't trust anybody to go behind her. No um, discomfort, very big a lot discomfort. Of, oh, I can only imagine it's, it's got to be absolutely hor horrific for her. Um, and then she also had the other ailment she had was a long-term injury from uh, what we believe was a vehicle accident when she was on the circus and it goes back, I think almost 20 or 30 years prior. Uh, and her left uh, elbow was completely fused, has no articulation in her left elbow at all, which didn't seem to bother her. Yeah. Uh, one thing in that space, we couldn't get a sense for how well she could walk because of all of the dung and all of the potholes in her enclosure. She was very, very slow and had to maneuver because, you know, even a human walking in there, you'd often trip because of the big giant holes for footprints from during the wet season. I guess that was about it. Very vocal, squeaky. Uh, the famous Hannah squeak uh, that everyone, uh, all of our followers became, uh, learned to, to know and love. Uh, so we went there with a the trailer and we opened up, uh, set up the trailer along the fence, opened up the fence, gave her access. And within 10 minutes, she was in the trailer. Uh, the next the next day, we were ready to close the trailer and we were opening and closing the trailer door. Uh, and I think it was on the third day or maybe the fourth day, uh, we left to come home and uh, for the long trek home. 
as a long ride. Yeah, from the West Coast, yeah. Because that was the piece of garbage truck, right? It was a beautiful old truck. <laughs> <laughs> An old timer. It was a it was an old time it was a truck that did not have a lot of force and it was really 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 slow. Uh, anytime we had to start going up the hills, it felt we were going like ten kilometers an hour for oh, no. an hour to get up each little incline. It was really I would really get slow. Little videos <laughs> of the when they were going uphill. He's like this truck. I was like, sorry. <laughs> We're going to be home in three days. We're going to be home in four days. We're going to be home in six days. It didn't extend the trip that much. I think it was a day longer than we had hoped uh, because we would have been arriving in the middle of the night. So we ended up postponing by a day. Did you still have a great um, police escort like you did for Gita and Maya? It was a little bit different on that one. Uh, we did have police escort, but it wasn't coordinated the same because there's a lot of areas there that are in the middle of Brazil that it's just, there's nothing. Uh, there is mm. nothing, nothing, nothing. And that was a trip that we were without reception for a long time, uh, mm. entire days. You know, there's a, a, on the other trips coming from the South, we're out of reception for sometimes six or seven hours. Mm. But I think there was a full period of almost 12 hours, no reception. Um, and then you're able to send one text message. Um, no photos. If you no have videos. it already set up yeah. <laughs> for like the five <laughs> seconds that you go through and that so you get reception. Another element of that, because of the coordination was a little bit different with the police for uh, police. We had several times where we were switching escorts and sometimes we had to wait at the police station that was on the side of the road. Uh, you didn't have to go off the road very much, but right on the side of the road and wait for the next escort to arrive. So sometimes okay. we had these delays for sometimes two or three hours waiting for the police escort to show up so that we could continue on the next leg. And it got to the point at one point we said, we can't wait. We're just going to drive. And if you're having to yeah. be with us, great. You no, know, if not, you know, we've got to keep on going. We can't do this to, to Hana anymore. That's the only trip that's ever happened with every yeah. other trip. It's been just the same team. Yeah. It was just, and again, that the, the complication because of the distance, you know, it was really, uh, or not the distance, but the amount of time in the middle of yeah. absolutely nowhere. Uh, so we've seen a lot of Brazil. I've seen a lot of Brazil. <laughs> by the highways and a lot of <laughs> truck stops and gas stations along the way and police stop stations, uh, the highway patrol stations. Um, but a relatively uneventful trip. She did exceptionally well throughout, mm -hmm. um, you know, compared to everybody. She's probably the easiest trip that way. Uh, really, really, really well. Was she the elephant that stepped off right away? I haven't had time to to check any YouTube videos. I'm sure there, that was the time, yeah, 2018. We're definitely into the internet age by then, so they must be alive. Uh, was she the one that stepped off straight away or? She stepped off backwards, right? And the top, top of the crate wasn't open. <laughs> yes, I forgot to open it. <laughs> the, the crate has two elements. It has a, 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 a horizontal hinge door and then two little butterfly wings that to close the very top portion that is angled. Um, and I forgot to open the butterfly wings and she ducked herself right on out. <laughs> she was <laughs> like, okay. I didn't remember if she went backwards or forwards. Yeah, I think she went backwards. She went backwards. Uh, in previous episodes, you said that um, many facilities ask you about introductions. And I know from other rescues that you shut off the other elephants in the other yards so that the elephant being rescued has got the elephant care center to itself. So how did you do, do this for, for Hana? And how, how did the introduction span out between the three and... Maya and Gita actually put themselves out of the way. Um... They had been closer to the care center. And then the night before she arrived, they went all the way to the back of four across the creek, essentially as far away from where Ahana would be as possible, um, as okay. long as they stayed within the fences. So, yeah, when Ahana got there, they were nowhere near where she was. And it was actually a few days before they ended up coming over. But one of the interesting things about Ahana with her arrival is, you know, people... I was going to say people say, but we've also seen elephants in captivity can definitely lose their ability to communicate as I'm going to say normal elephants. Mm. We would have elephants that would lose each other in Tennessee. I mean, like <laughs> lose each other when they're not that far away. They don't call to each other. They don't do anything. They go in the wrong direction. I mean, you or be, they call and they still run in the wrong direction. Yeah, you'd be <laughs> amazed. Um, 
And here you have Hana, who's essentially supposed to have lived her entire life alone. She's how old over was she at that age? There was a conflict in the number. Some said over oh, sixty, some right. said over, or, or, definitely over fifty-five. Yeah, uh, but oh, some wow. rec- some records suggested over sixty. So oh. she came into the care center. She chased one of our roosters, um, <laughs> <laughs> which he, he was fine with. He was like, "Okay, running." Um, and then she went over and smelled the treatment chute. And we had done just a couple of days before that, we had done footwork on, I don't remember whether it was Maya or Gita and she smelled and she smelled and she smelled and then she picked up her head and she did this huge rumble that is generally a rumble that they use to call each other. And it's like, wow. All right. It's like, good for you. That's pretty impressive. And it was just a little bit surprising because again, we've worked with elephants that, have lived with other elephants in all different scenarios and still did not communicate in that way. I think we definitely see the girls here and it's not just her. I mean, I think most of them communicate much better with each other than the elephants in the U S I don't know why. And those of us then who want like happy ends, they probably thought, Oh, Guido and Maya would come running, but they didn't. So they obviously knew that (laughs) traveled, that traveled far. So they knew, uh oh, someone else is coming. Yeah, you know, it's they took a couple of days to decide that they were interested in meeting her, which is all fine and well. You know, they can do their own thing. It had to have been within the first three days because the other people from the SEB team were still here. And then they came over by the barn and it was relatively uneventful. I mean, everybody just seemed mellow and not overly excited and not anything negative so they ended up going into i can picture the tree which yard is that yard one wasn't it no no i think it was yard it was yard two because we were in yard three taking video of them by the tree that is right by all three of them then yeah we let them in together since they seemed fine and they just hung out together by the tree and you know there was a little bit of smelling back and forth and they ended up going back and forth between the smaller yards and it wasn't really anything. There wasn't anything remarkable initially. Hana was, you know, quiet and well-behaved and Maya and Gita were interested, but not overly. And yeah, it was, it was kind of, I don't want to say boring, but there definitely wasn't anything overly exciting going on initially. It wasn't until a little bit later that that shifted. And were you then able to assess Hannah's gait then when she was actually walking to see how how bad this um, fused elbow was? It wasn't was as bad as we had expected? No, I and mean, we didn't think it was going to be, you know, we knew the el- elbow was fused. It wasn't, uh, the assessment was just to see her mobility, mm-hmm. how much yeah. how much of an impact it had on her. And similar to what we saw with other elephants, you know, in our past, they all just learn to adapt. Sure. You know, they just, it doesn't seem to bother them at all. And she has to move in different ways. She has to shift her body a little differently, sometimes depending on the slope of the, the grade of the, the hill. I mean, the grade of the terrain, but they just adapt. They just, they just figure it all out and uh, they do mm-hmm. incredibly well. So yeah, she much. can be speedy. Yeah. I, mean, she definitely <laughs> I think she surprises people. Not how as speedy fast she as Gita and Maya, but no. she can, she can move. Yeah. I think one of the nicest things with her, for her well-being was that i think it was the second day she was here she allowed us to close her into the treatment chute Mm -hmm. and clean up her vulva area and medicate and treat i mean people would be watching the live videos and they're like what is she doing because it hurts so much she's actually kicking her own vulva with her back foot she's kicking it she's trying to scratch it i mean she was so uncomfortable and we didn't know if she was going to let us do anything because she wasn't even letting people go behind her at the other facility. So we decided to give it a try and she was great. I mean, She's as soon as we started hosing yeah. it off and cleaning it, she backed up to the bars. You know, she let us do, I don't even remember the first time how long we were up in her business. But even just closing her in the shoot for the first time, sure. closing her into that confined yeah, space. Yeah, after two days. She, wow. She was exceptional from the get go. Very trusting. Yep. Yeah, it's almost like she said, you know, 
okay, you know, whatever you need to do, I've got it. You know, she trusted us much more, much faster than my Ankita. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. She was, and I think part of it was as soon as we did anything with it, mm-hmm. you know, there is that recognition that, oh, that feels better. That's mm-hmm. like, I'm not necessarily excited about whatever it is you're doing in the, you know, right, in the uh, moment, yeah. but <laughs> I mean, for her, it could have been the first time that actually felt better in years. So she was so easy and so good with all of that. But I think she's also one that really keyed off of that, the level of respect, mm-hmm. you know, the level of understanding and communication. You know, you could see different elements, that she, and different things that she did, and we respond appropriately. You know, when you do those appropriate responses based on the behavior, based on the communication, they immediately become more comfortable. Um, She's she, still like that. Yeah. <laughs> but so that's she'd for been, later. So if Hannah had been alone for such a long time, uh, how did she then fit into the small herd that awaited her? Not the way she <laughs> wanted to. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think I remember you saying that she was quite... Uh, after a while, very overpowering, sort of very sort of, uh, I'm a the little, new girl here. And, a little yeah. exuberant. Exuberant a little is the word, yeah, exuberant. I don't remember if that was before the night that she came running out of the bushes. I don't know. It's all a big blur. I think they probably <laughs> did the reunion first. But see, after that moment went out in the pasture, when she overwhelmed her sisters with love, uh, <laughs> um, did she... I think that she didn't go out there quite as much. So I think there was that, I think it was a couple of days. I don't know. Because it was one of the first nights that we had her calling us to her. Yeah. She was great that way too. Um, She, there was, I don't want to say an incident because nothing really happened. But (laughs) when you talk about like a specific moment where she totally overwhelmed my Angita. My and Gita at that point are very close, you know, and, and very physically affectionate with one another. And when they want to be next to each other, they want to be next to each other. Um, but Hannah did not know how to read the room by any stretch of the imagination, or maybe she did and she just couldn't control mm-hmm. her That's desire <laughs> to, it seemed like she wanted what they had. She wanted mm. that with them. And it's like, mm. whoa, that took, you know, that took a while for them to get there. And that's with 40 years of history. It's not going to come overnight. Mm. But she, you know, it was kind of that puppy energy of, can I come? Can I come? Can I come? Can I stand (laughs) next to you? Can I go between you? Can I? And she would like try and maneuver herself between the two of them when they're standing together, like touching each other. And they were really good about just trying to move away and trying to let her know, you know, that's not what they wanted. and. She just, she, but I love you, but I love you, but I love you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in her was, face. She, she did not give them any space at all. You know, and she was so exuberant. And then somebody tried to lay down. And the Gita tried to lay down, take a nap. I don't remember which one, but I do remember that she wasn't letting them sleep. Yeah. And they were after, at that point, they would nap a lot in the afternoon. They would have their breakfast. They would go for a swim or whatever. And then they would nap. And she was not letting them take a nap. She just wouldn't let them lay down because, Aww. oh, that's right. Because she panicked yeah. every time they went to lay down. She would trumpet and freak out as if something was wrong. And I don't know whether she just didn't understand. All they want to do is take a nap. And so the girls were then, not only were they losing tolerance, they were tired. <laughs> she wasn't letting them sleep. And finally they were like, no, this, you're not doing this. And Hannah had her feelings hurt for sure. Yeah. Yeah. They closed her how up. Was that exp- oh, they closed her up. I was going to say, so how do they express that? Just turn their back on her and walked away? Yeah, for the most part. And they did push her a couple of times, you know, nothing really bad or anything. Oh, nothing, Maya did for uh, the most part. Yeah, too. nothing nothing extreme, nothing that was going to cause any physical harm. Uh, but there was a clear and obvious, you know, we're, you're not, we're not ready for you to be our blood, blood sister yet. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> they, she, they needed a little bit more time. And I often wondered because, you know, we, we look in, look into these scenarios and we're, you know, looking in from the outside, uh, the only way that we can. And I also wondered if it was, if either of them felt like it was a jeopardy to what they were still developing, you Mm -hmm. know, they were just getting to that point where they were 
fully bonded. Mm-hmm. You know, it hadn't been mm-hmm. that many months really before they really had that incredibly strong, you know, friendship and wondered if that felt like it was, again, a throwing a wrench into the works of what they were still evolving. Mm-hmm. And I know for a lot of people, it was hard to see because we share, you know, everything that goes on. We're really transparent. We don't want to pretend it's all puppies and rainbows. That's easy enough to do. I mean, we could totally fake that if we wanted to, but it, it was takes puppies in excessive love. <laughs> <laughs> but it takes away from what captivity really does to them and the struggles that they do have. And there's no reason to dismiss that, you know, just because everything's not 100% positive doesn't mean it's a bad thing. And I think Hana. And that situation is a great example of it because she did have her feelings hurt. She wanted to be their best friend and they were not having it. And she did go off more on her own and spend time by herself. And, you know, she would go in yard five when they were in four and she was still excited because it was still all this space and everything that was new. And it's not like she's in the corner depressed somewhere. Um, But, you know, she, she was hurt. And Mm. even through all of that, and we shared it with people, you know, that she was off by herself and that they had kind of shooed her away and so on and so forth. But I really do believe that whole scenario is what taught Hana to be the elephant that she is. And Mm. I think that part of her is the most amazing part of her. So Mm. it wasn't necessarily easy for her in the moment to feel like she finally had the companionship of other elephants and they were closer with each other than with her. And they didn't want that from her, but I do think it shaped who she is right now. And it shaped a mm. really wonderful experience with Rama's relationship in the first few oh days, God, which we'll get to was... in a later episode, <laughs> yeah. uh, which was really, really endearing. It was sweet. really charming, but yeah. it was like, oh my God, this isn't my Angita. You're okay. Yeah, it was really, um, really sweet. But it, again, it shifted her a lot, but she is incredibly influential in a very passive way. And for everybody, yeah. she grounds everybody around her. Yeah, she's yeah. amazing. So I know we're running short on time again, Nadia, but let me say uh, to lend on a, on a silly happy note with Anna. Um, she was exploring nighttime as everyone else is exploring nighttime. Mm-hmm. And there were a few times that we leave the house because there is roaring, you know, screaming in the habitat. We're not leaving the house. We're like running, actually <sighs> running. And I don't really run <laughs> for almost anything. Running out of the door, hopping on the four wheeler, racing down the hill to find out what's going on because she's making these noises that generally would only come from an elephant. That is like something catastrophic is going on. But so we get out there and sometimes she's crashing through the bushes. And then when she stops, she's like, I'm just going to start grazing now. Like everything's (laughs) fine. And then I think one time actually on the cameras, I think we had the camera then or somehow we saw the, we have a camera at that point. I think it was the drone. We were Uh, watching her on the drone run from like the back of four all the way through the woods in four and. Yeah, she was something else. Like, uh, what's wrong with her? What happened? And it's probably like, I saw a taper. <laughs> or, you know. Well, that was the one time in the middle of the night that we had to go running down there. And it was the first time because we're like, oh, my God, what is wrong? It's like, because we didn't get any sort of hint from Maya and Gita that there would be any confrontation. No. You know, it was they didn't want to be friends with her. They didn't want to beat her up. They just wanted her to go away. And clearly she learned that they wanted her to go away. So we hear this bellowing and roaring and it's probably like 11 o'clock at night, go racing down the hill and no one else is there except for her. And then we see a taper like 20 yards away and we're like, really? <laughs> That's what that was all about. We're like, holy cow, well, she Hannah. Did, she didn't know what a taper was. But even with that, it wasn't like fear. It was just like playful exuberance again. She yeah. had so well, much energy and so much, you know, <laughs> passion, you know, for life. You yeah. know, it was really she interesting. She was happy to be there. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely learned that she was going to be a little bit of the boy who cried wolf as far as her noises went. And then she, of course, learned that when she did them, we came running because, you know, you have to make sure everything's okay. So there's a little bit of a game that way as well. But she's cute. She's very endearing, for sure. I'm hearing in the background, I actually just uh, heard that in the previous episode as well, towards the end of our recording, there's like a, a very loud little bird. Yeah, yeah, the little no weep, weep, weep. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. Who, I don't know who he is. 
I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's so many. We have those little birds that are very similar to mockingbirds, uh, much smaller, but very similar coloration to mockingbirds that we have in the U.S. Um, and they make a little weak noise, but I'm not sure if that's the one it is. There's still too much to identify. Uh, still too many species to fully recognize. Well, uh, I'll, I'll g leave you then with a uh, little to do. You can find out what the little weep, weep noise is. Cause he actually sounds like he's like inside your house, but obviously we having no windows and some other doors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he's probably right outside, which makes it sound like he's inside. So yes, I'll, I'll let you go. You've got a lot to do as always. And thank you for taking the time for this week's episode and yes, catch up in two weeks time. Thank you, Nadia again. It's always a pleasure. Bye. That brings us to the end of this week, and we are at elephant number three. We're collecting elephants very fast now. We've got the beautiful property. We have three elephants. And yes, catch up in two weeks' time. And until then, take care. Bye. <laughs>